play a game. Why, yes. I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> Live from Little Rock, it's Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Sachs. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, whether you're listening live on Saturday, April 7th at um, 1 p.m. Central, or if you're listening on, on the online stream, and we are on 101.1 FM now. We're still the answer, but we've, uh, we're have we on 101.1, which is a clearer, stronger signal, and we're no longer on 96.5. Still the same station, just different frequencies. So we've been trying to announce that quite a bit uh, and hope we got the word out. But you can still listen 101.1 in the uh, Little Rock metro area, or you can go to 1011fmtheanswer.com and listen to the live stream anywhere from in the world, I guess, as long as you have internet uh, somewhere in the world. So there we go. Again, I'm your host, Shane Stacks. This is Shane Plays Geek Talk. It's a journey into the things we love, geeky, cool, pop culture stuff, movies, TV, comic books, role-playing games, fantasy, so you name it. If it's geeky, then it goes on Shane Plays Geek Talk. Got, got a great show for you today, as always. Um, today we've got, and I'll introduce him here in a second. He's back on the show. Uh, one of the, the comic talents that I admire the most, his name is Tom Scioli. And if you don't know his work, you really, really need to go check it out. Um, it's, it's really amazing stuff, but I do want to rem remind everyone, this is first and foremost, a live talk radio show. So you can call in at 501 823-0965. That's 501-823-0965. Or you can tweet me at Shane Plays. That's S-H-A-N-E-P-L-A-Y-S during the live show. So just check Tom. Do I have you? Hi, Shane. Hey, man. It's great to talk to you again. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, we're going to be talking today about Jack Kirby, who is really just, I mean, I, you can't really talk about American comic books, especially mainstream superhero comics, without acknowledging the incredibly massive role that Jack Kirby played. Uh, and, and, and as I understand it, you also have a, well, not as I understand, I know for a fact you have a Kirby comic you're working on that's sort of a biography of Kirby's life. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you, last year when you came on, uh, you were kind enough that you were, you were at some sort of event with your grandmother or your aunt and you had had to come out to the parking lot and get in your car and call me. <laughs> <laughs> so as, are we in a, uh, are you in a more, are you in the comfort of your own home today? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm in the comfort of my home studio. Uh, and I was just okay. working on, on my Kirby comic, uh, right before, uh, we talked. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for making that effort last time. I really appreciate it. I, oh, sure, as yeah. I, as I've, as I've told you and as I've told other people, I mean, you are a very unique talent, uh, in, in comic books and, uh, you know, and, and to talk to you about Jack Kirby considering, I mean, everything you do is, is in some ways, I'm not going to say homage, uh, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of Kirby in what you do. You're not copying him, but you're definitely using that same bombastic, energetic kind of gonzo style, uh, that he had. So we will, we're definitely, we're going to talk today, um, uh, about Kirby and your, uh, and your Kirby comic, anything else you want to talk about? But I, I did want to ask, uh, I've got some show notes I have to get to here in a second, but I did want to ask, are there any other projects or you have anything coming out or that you're working on that you want to make sure people know about before we, you know, start talking about Jack Kirby? Well, the last time I was on, uh, we were talking about uh, Transformers versus G.I. Joe, and there's currently a Transformers versus G.I. Joe hardcover that collects my entire uh, story, my entire run uh, that I did with John Barber. I, I think that anybody, the, the, and again, man, I know it sounds like that, you know, I'm just like, oh, Tom, I mean, you're amazing. <laughs> this Transformers versus G.I. Joe needs to be studied in in classes that deal with comics as an art form. You did stuff in that, that I've never seen anybody else do on a comics page. Um, you know, and I think I even said last time that we talked that it's, it's like the Stanley Kubrick, 2001, a space odyssey of, of comics. So people really need to go check it out. So that, that hardcover is out right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. People really, now, is there anything extra? I know like in your, in your monthly series, one of the things I really liked, uh, 
that you put like almost like a director's commentary at the end of every issue mm-hmm. that would go page by page, panel by panel. Is there anything extra that people are going to get in the hardcover? Yeah, I mean, it's got all of that stuff. It's got um, the movie adaptation that I did where I did sort of like a movie <laughs> adaptation as if they made a movie of my comic I, and I made a comic. I, I, and and then you comic. did, yeah, I have that. that. Yeah, they're very, I don't know if meta is the right word, but yeah, you did a, you did Transformers vs. G.I. Joe. The was it, it was twelve issues plus the zero issue, if I remember right. Yeah, something uh, like that. And then, and then you did, um, like as if they made a movie from the comic book, and then you did a comic adaptation of the movie. <laughs> yeah. So very, yeah, which and we're and wherein you did some even different stuff that you had done in the original series. So so that hardcover includes that. Yeah, it has that, and and there, there's some other additional things, uh, uh, sketches and, and drawings and, and essays and stuff, uh, in addition to all, all the other extras and things that were in the original series to begin with. Fantastic. Yeah. People need to go check that out if they haven't seen it already. You know, I, I, uh, I, I introduced just a few days ago, I've got a friend who, you know, he's big into comics and everything. And, and I said, have you seen Tom Scioli's work? And, and he said, no, I don't think so. And I showed him uh, a lot of your two-page spreads from Transformers versus G.I. Joe. And he said that he thinks he sees some uh, Mobius influence in there. Is that is that one of your influences? Yeah, I mean, I, I like all kinds. I mean, Kirby's my favorite, but uh, but I, right. I, I mean, I'm just a fan of comics in general. And, you know, I've, right. I've studied pretty much everybody, and, and Mobius is definitely in there. Right. All right. Well, there. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell him that that uh, that. Yes, he he did spot a little bit of Mo, or Gene Gerard, Gerard, however you want to say. Right, it. I always yeah. say Mobius. Um, OK, well, I've got some housekeeping notes that I need to get to. And then after that, we've got a couple of uh, comic book news items. And then we're going to be talking about your Kirby comic strip or comic series that you're doing online. And, and then why Jack Kirby himself is so important. So again, thanks for joining us again. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you back on Shane Plays Geek Talk. Um, did want to point out to people, if I sound a little bit different this week, uh, I'm actually at home on Skype because I came down sick yesterday and I slept about 12 hours last night and woke up about an hour ago and uh, called Zach, my engineer, my trusty engineer, worked it out. So I'm, I'm actually at home. I don't think I've ever done the show this way before. I, I much prefer to do it in the studio uh, because, you know, the, even though I love podcasts, the, the, the sound quality in the studio is just so good. And, you know, plus I get to watch Zach press all the buttons and pretend that I'm on the final frontier in the Star, Starship Enterprise. Um, but anyway, so if it sounds a little bit different, uh, that's why I'm actually on Skype at home in my home uh, office work, working all this out. So, but, but hopefully it sounds okay. Tom, uh, Tom, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Okay, great. Well, maybe, maybe if I hadn't said anything, nobody would know the difference. So, all right, folks, again, this is uh, live talk radio, but we do go out a few days later as a podcast, uh, the show notes and links. If you're listening to the podcast or the Krypton radio version, uh, the, the links for today's show will be up at shameplays.com. Last week's show is archived on the blog and, and out there in the various podcast uh, area or venues, and that was RPG Kickstarters with Mythords. DM Jared, that was a that was a fun show where we're doing two or three times a year. Uh, DM Jared of Mythord Loot Crate Service uh, rounds up uh, RPG Kickstarters tabletop RPG Kickstarters. He thinks we should know about. So it's the second time we've done that great show. As I said, this show is also a podcast because I love both mediums. And it goes out on the blog, on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, or Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, and more. And I do also put up the show on the YouTube channel at uh, youtube.com slash go shame plays. And then last, <clears throat> but never, ever, ever least, shame plays is also carried on Krypton Radio. Krypton Radio is sci-fi for your Wi-Fi, kryptonradio.com got a couple of uh, a sponsor and a PSA to take care of here. One is a shame play sponsor, Arkansas RPG con 2018 badge sales are now open. Vendor and sponsorship options are also open. Go to arpgcon.com for more info and make sure to follow Arkansas RPG con on Facebook. This will be the second year that Carl Heil has done the Arkansas RPG con a lot of fun, good mix of, uh, of old school gaming and new gaming. And, uh, this year, the last year was so successful, 
<clears throat> that he's already had to find a different venue for this year that can hold more uh, folks gaming. So we'll be in Montmel this year. Last year we were in Benton. Now this is a PSA, not a an ad or for a sponsor. It's a PSA, public service announcement. Heroes and Angels Comic Con, April 28th. 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Greenbrier Events Greenbrier Event Center in Greenbrier, Arkansas. It's actually, from what I'm hearing, it's it's sleeting and possibly snowing around Greenbrier right now. It's kind of weird out there today. Heroes and Angels Comic Con. You don't want to miss this. Tons of activities for the kids, special guests, and free admission. Donations will be accepted. All proceeds go to Heroes and Angels, a nonprofit organization that provides assistance to families affected by childhood cancer and to military families in need. And as I, I mention every time uh, I feature Heroes and Angels Comic Con, Heroes and Angels was one of the organizations for a few months ago when um, uh, the that fraudster put on a supposed convention here in Little Rock and ran with the money. They were they were one of the uh, the organization is impacted like that. So support Heroes and Angels at the Heroes and Angels Comic Con, April 28th, 10 to 4 p.m. at the Greenbrier Event Center. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, we are now on 101.1. We are no longer on 96.5, although we are still the answer. And we are on a stronger, clearer signal. And if you're in Conway or Moralton uh, and you're hearing this show or this station now, that's because we have a clearer, stronger, uh, clearer, stronger signal. All right, so Tom, I got to do this thing where, all right, the head of my new team, Sal, right? He literally wears a fedora and chomps a cigar. Well, his grandmother and her dog, Muffin, if I don't, if I don't banter with my engineer, Zach, they get upset and I get, I get nasty emails and sometimes even a nasty postcard. So I've got, I've got a, I've got a banter with Zach. Zach, how are you doing this morning or I'm, this afternoon? I'm doing good. Good, man. Mm -hmm. Thanks for working with me to 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 do the show from home today like yep. i said it's not my preference but evidently it sounds good so so i, I really appreciate that making that happen so i was going to ask you well first i'm going to give you a heads up because mm -hmm. you because you know i'm always trying to uh increase your 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 movie knowledge not just the new movies but the old movies okay so i think like in a couple of months uh Stanley Kubrick's 2001: A Space Odyssey yeah. is coming to is coming to theaters in the original 70 millimeter print. Okay, so I you need to go watch that. All have right. you ever seen 2001: A Space Odyssey? I may have seen it once before, but it was probably a long okay. time ago. All right, you need to go see it in the theater. I've never seen it in the theater. I want to go. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's 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 a groundbreaking movie. It's amazing. And, and to see it in a theater. And I know you're a movie buff, mm -hmm. so I was making sure you know it. So keep an eye out on that. The other thing I was going to ask you about, uh, have you seen this FTL short film that's making its way around YouTube? I have not. Okay, it's called FTL. Mm -hmm. Tom, have you seen it? Uh, no, tell me about it. Okay, so it's a short film. It's about 16 minutes long. It's it's won a lot of awards. You can find it on you can find it on YouTube, but it's it's basically... It's a short film about uh, the first faster than light uh, uh, f test flight. So you know we're, we're in space where they where they actually go to warp or or whatever mm -hmm. uh, faster than light, light speed, et cetera. And it, it, it's it's it. I, I had assumed you would have heard of it, Zach, because it's it's been getting hype like you know nobody's business. So I was just curious if you've seen it. My take on it, it's really good. Yeah. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's got good special effects and good acting. I like the story. I like how it ends. But I do wonder if like if you caught it on sci fi, right. the sci fi channel, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it would be getting as much hype. I think a lot of the reason that it's getting as much hype as it is is because people are seeing it on YouTube. Right. And they're still not used to seeing amazing stuff on YouTube only. You know what I mean? Yeah. I like so it, so comparatively, it's still good. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But I was at, you know, I was just, I'm curious if, you know, cause I mean, people are like, it's the most amazing movie ever, five out of five, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and it is good. Don't get me wrong. I thought it was cool. Right. But I could, I couldn't help thinking, you know, if, if people were flipping channels on cable and caught it, right. they'd probably go, oh, that was kind of neat. And mm -hmm. then keep going. Mm -hmm. But since it's on YouTube, they're like, you know, and it's got that kind of support the underdog thing, right? That yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's like, oh, it's the best thing ever. So anyway. Okay. I have to check that it out. Was, that's my big take on that. Yeah, but it's called FTL, and FTL stands for short film. And, you know, people out there are like, no, it's a great movie. Yeah, it, it was really well done. Don't get me wrong. But I do question the amount of hype 
that it's getting. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, do, does that make sense? Tom, you can chime in on this too. Sometimes the venue that you watch something affects your perception of it. Yeah. The, right? the medium is the message as Marshall McLuhan said. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, I'm not taking away from the fact that it's good, but you know, if you, there's different expectations of quality and whatever, depending on what medium you see it in. Right. So that, that was my point there. But you know, like I said, they did, they made a neat movie and, and uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from that. And I did like, I don't want to go too much into it. Um, but I did like how it all resolves. You know, I, th I thought that was kind of neat. So okay. anyway. All right. So speaking of Sal and the news team, uh, Zach, let's turn on the microphone, the super secret microphone in the, in the, uh, in the news offices. Oh, there they go. Working on Saturday, working hard. Now, uh, Tom, I, I picked out some news items, at least one specifically, uh, because you were coming on the show today. All three of these are comic book news items, but, but this one, uh, I'm, I'm happy to see, and all I can say is I, I hope they don't blow it. Uh, I, I'm assuming, Tom, that you saw that, that Fantastic Four is finally official, officially coming back to Marvel Comics. Yeah, glad to see them back. Yeah, exactly, right? Because this is one of the quintessential Kirby creations, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Where, but and also, I mean, the they're the, of, go ahead. Well, you could say it's the beginning of like what we know of as Marvel, that 60s Marvel revolution. Fantastic Four right. was the first one in there. Right. And it's, you know, it's a classic thing. And, and for whatever reason, the last couple of years, there, there's people have their theories. Uh, I, I don't want to get into all that. But for whatever reason, Marvel hasn't been publishing Fantastic Four for a couple of years, which I think is a shame, right? I think that there's some, if you're a comic book company like DC or Marvel, there's some series that should just be perpetually going, you know, because there, there's so much of the, of the DNA of who you are as a company. And I, I think Fantastic Four is one of them. So, uh, but yeah, Fantastic Four is coming back. Uh, and it, and it looks like that, uh, Dan slot is going to be right. Or let me see if I, yeah, I think Dan slot is going to be writing it. Uh, I don't, I can't see here who the, uh, the artist is going to be, but yeah, a creative team of Dan slot and uh, Sarah and I hope I don't mess this wrong. Pacelli will uh, are going to, are going to be uh, bringing the Fantastic Four back. Now I've been reading Marvel Two and One, uh, the new Marvel Two and One, where that basically has the thing in Johnny Storm, like looking for uh, Mister Fantastic and the Invisible Woman, uh, sort of. What what's really going on is is the thing Ben Grimm knows that they're dead. But uh, he's told Johnny Storm that maybe they're alive because he's trying to give Johnny hope and a purpose. So they're hopping around the multiverse, finding other versions of the Fantastic Four. So which everyone assumed was sort of a hint that the main Fantastic Four was coming back. And, 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 and lo and behold, uh, the Fantastic Four is coming back. So and that that news item is from comic book resources, CBR dot com. So and now, uh, you know, Tom, obviously, uh Fantastic Four is important to superhero comics and Marvel specifically, but I mean, are you a, I mean, some stuff we're like, we like it because we know how important it is. And some stuff we like because we like it on its own merits. I've always been a Fantastic Four fan. I mean, do you like the Fantastic Four itself? It's interesting. I'm a huge fan of the world of the Fantastic Four. I love all the characters that started there, all the characters they meet, the Silver Surfer, uh, I love the Inhumans, Galactus, all those things started there. And then, the Fantastic Four themselves are a little bit dull. They're like a little bit 50s, except for The Thing. The Thing, to me, is like maybe one of Kirby's like greatest creations. I love uh, The Thing, you know, yeah. Yeah, so distinctive. But but the, the rest of the team, to me, they need a little sprucing up. So, so hope, you know, a, a, a little updating. So hopefully, um, you know, ho hopefully Dan Slott will, will, will do that with this new one. Right. Yeah. I always loved when they would go into like the, uh, the negative universe or what negative yeah. universe what was it like we're a nihilist and the all that with, yeah. you know, I, I like the fantastic four more when they're adventurers and explorers and reluctant superheroes, you know, that's, that's, that's the fantastic four. I like now, is it true? I've heard, but I don't know if it's true that they were basically like, you know, cause DC has the challengers of the unknown. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I've heard that, 
that was they basically they took the challengers of the unknown and gave them superpowers for Marvel. Do you think there's any truth to that? Oh, I mean, totally. I mean, it, it was Jack Kirby did the challengers of the unknown, and then uh, not too long after that went over to Marvel. And and there's really a direct line. Uh, some of the challengers of the unknown. There's a challengers of the unknown story where a guy gets one of the challengers gets the power to to turn into a living flame, uh, where he get where he turns into. Uh, like a giant, where, he, where he's able to to uh, oh. <laughs> turn invisible, you know. So, so yeah, there, there, it's direct line. It, it, Kirk, Kirby did that a lot, where he would just keep building and building and building on the same themes, and whatever comic he was working on was was almost like a continuation of something that he did previously. Did before, all right. So this also, I'm going to ask your opinion on this. Uh, I've heard it stated, and when I take a look uh, at at the original X Men versus the original Doom Patrol, I think there may be some merit to it. I've heard that the X-Men were basically, uh, let's be polite, inspired by the original Doom Patrol. Do you think that there's any truth to that? I mean, my take was always that they, it it was one of those moments where they both kind of captured a moment and that they were both produced independently of each other. I'm assuming there's some kind of like third influence that that was maybe in the popular culture then that we're not that inspired as now that they might have been yeah but but my sense is that that they, they were both sort of synchronous gotcha yeah i didn't i mean i don't know you know because it's when you look you're like well you've got the leader in a wheelchair and mm-hmm. then you've got you know some very strange oddball characters you know that they're defending a world that thinks that they're weird so anyway yeah and i mean i'm not making an accusation i don't know <laughs> but when on the surface of yeah, it, I'm like, it, yeah, there, that, yeah, there is some similarities there. So, but what are yeah, they? What's the quote? With Swamp Thing and Swamp Thing and Man Thing. It was kind of a similar yeah. story where they both came out at the same time. It's not clear, you know, if one influenced the other yeah. or if it's just, you know. Yeah. No. The, it, exactly. Right. Sometimes it's just it just kind of spontaneously happens. So, um, but but anyway, yeah. I'm just I'm always curious, you know. And and what's the uh, what's the quote? all great artists steal. They're just, some are better at hiding their sources or something. There's something yeah. like that. Like, you know, all, all great artists and movie makers and all that, you know, they all have influences, you know, some of them are just better at, at hiding the trail there than others. They all stand on somebody else's shoulders in, in some way. So, um, another article here from CBR that involves Marvel. So Marvel is doing a 2018 fresh start initiative, uh, that is going to redo some of their, uh, comic series, and they're going to start doing this dual numbering system. Have you? Did you see this? Mm-mm. Okay, so they're going to relaunch like Avengers at number one, uh, and they're going to they're going to overhaul they're going to overhaul their line again. And I mean, Marvel's been doing that a lot recently. Let's you know, they're DC and Marvel both do it, but Marvel really seems to be continually tinkering here lately. Um, and and they're gonna they're gonna do this thing called the Fresh Start. And moving forward, some of their titles are going to have dual numbering. So, for example, you might pick up a Avengers number one that is also like an Avengers number seven fifty, mm-hmm. right? So they're they're wanting to, I, I guess, I don't, I mean, I don't even. I, this sounds like I'm being, you know, down on them. Like, well, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too, but they want the freshness of a jumping on point, but they also want to maintain the fact that you know, this, that, that for collectors and stuff like that, where this stuff fits into the overall story. So, or, you know, the overall publishing history. So, um, and then, uh, when they relaunch the Avengers, it's going to be the only Avengers title, but it will release 18 issues per year rather than 12. And I'm not sure what all series are going to be, um, affected by this, but evidently they're relaunching a lot of their stuff with, with number one. So, and then they're going to do this, this dual numbering system. So it's, it's no secret that in fact, the guy, uh, Michael Tierney, he's a sponsor of the show and he's had comic book stores since early eighties. He said, this is the first time he's ever consistently seen DC outperform Marvel the entire time he's been a comic shop owner. So, uh, you know, DC seems to really be firing on all cylinders right now while, you know, Marvel seems like it it's trying to regroup and, and sort stuff out. So, um, anyway, do you, you know, I always, I always wonder, Tom, like people like yourself that are, that are comics creators and are like heavy into making comics. Do you, how much do you keep up with the mainstream stuff that's happening right now? I mean, I do, I do keep, it's, it's really easy to keep up with, 
because of you know because of the internet and stuff. But there, that horse race is always going right. to happen. And and currently DC is is ahead in the horse race. But I I just feel like like uh, Marvel has, you know has like a history of consistently being ahead. So I I, I think even though even though DC's at this moment maybe ahead in that horse race that that Marvel Marvel's going to come back. And I mean I I read more. Marvel comics myself than than DC, so you know from my perspective, it's 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 more Marvel. I mean, I'm a, I'm fans of, of both, uh, yeah, but you know both universes. But but it just, I mean, Marvel, it's like one of the laws of the universe that like Marvel right. number one. It's, right. Well, they, you know, I'll be honest. The last few years, Marvel has lost a lot of my interest, but they're gaining yeah. it back. I'm reading more Marvel now than I have for a while. You know, I, I like some of the, and they've got C.B. Sobolski, which is that not a perfect name for the comics editor of, you know what I mean? The the editor, right, C.B. Yeah. Sobolski, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, got yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. that Jonah Jameson or something. It's got that kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got that kind of whatever. So, yeah, C.B. Sobolski is heading the, heading the, heading the team over there. And, and, and I don't, I like for D.C., and Marvel to both do well, you know, because oh, I, I'm a I'm a comics nerd. I'm a mainstream four color superhero comic books nerd. So you know, I like a, I like all the comics companies to do well. I don't want to see any of them fold or or to fail. Um, I, although at times I will get upset if they overly tinker with one of my characters that I love. But mm-hmm. you know, that's just that's just part of being a geek fanboy. So all right, last news item here, and I thought this was good. Uh, this is from Newsarama. And this is good. This is this. Speaking of the health of the industry, did you see this? That uh, you know, there, DC is doing doing this DC Nation number zero, which is sort of an anthology of of different stories in the DC universe. And then, of course, Action Comics number one thousand is coming out in uh, in about a week, week and a half, which is the mm-hmm. thousandth issue of you know Action Comics with Superman. Right. DC Nation number zero superhero. has one million orders. That's fantastic. And then yeah, Action yeah. Comics number one thousand has five hundred has five hundred thousand offers, and Dan, uh, you probably know better than I do. I don't know if it's Didio or Didio. Uh, yeah, Didio. Didio. Yeah, he said uh, that that's the the best that he's ever seen since he's been with DC. He said that's the highest selling single issue in his time with DC, which DC Nation number zero. So yeah. I, I feel like in the in the eighties, I mean, comics sold in much higher numbers than they do now, but mm-hmm. that's a you know, that's that's a very good number. And I mean, I think that speaks to the health of the industry. You know, it's not going anywhere. So how how do you feel as a comics creator when you hear numbers like that? Yeah, to hear a number like that is good because you do think of them as being numbers from another era. Like the early nineties maybe would have been the last time you'd hear a you know, like a million seller. So yeah, that is that is great news. Yeah. Did you ever see, in fact, I went and tried to find this a few months ago. You remember uh, the M. Night Shyamalan movie Unbreakable? Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the beginning of that, they sh- they flash some numbers about comic book sales, and it was like ridiculously high numbers. And I've never, I even got on the internet and tried to find that, and I couldn't find it. I'm curious what what you know sales are now, like because that uh, that that uh, the the facts or whatever that they put at the beginning of Unbreakable were like, this is how many are sold a day. This is on average how many are read per minute and all that stuff. So, uh, but there's there's no doubt that mainstream superhero comics have had a major influence on pop culture. I mean, just look at the TV and the movies right now, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they're dominating and informing pretty much or a huge part of our pop culture right now. All right, I, Tom, I got to get us to a break. When we come back, I want to talk about your Kirby comic and Jack Kirby in general, why he's so important. Because you you really can't talk about uh, the comic book medium as we know it without, without Jack Kirby. And so I'm curious why... Yeah. You know what? What inspired you to do a Kirby biography and and all and all of that good stuff? Um, so anyway, I'm gonna get us to a break. I'm gonna throw a little love at a sponsor. We'll hit a break and we come back. We'll talk more with Tom Cioli, comics creator, unique talent, Tom Cioli and Jack Kirby. So uh, here we go, Zach. I'm gonna I'm gonna read this ad for Little Rock Comic Con and then we'll cut to a break. Ten years strong. The tenth annual Little Rock Comic Con is May 19th and 20th at the Benton Event Center. This year features the largest selection of comics in LRCC history with 15, count them, 15 booths of nothing but comics, 
plus other great vendors as well. Don't miss the cosplay contest or the after party with VIP con guests at Dave & Buster's. Con guests include Blake Foster of the Power Rangers, Michelle Harrison of the Flash TV show, Transformers comic artist Robbie Musso, and Jesse Wittenrick, and more. Celebrating 10 years strong, this year's Little Rock Comic Con is May 19th and 20th. Find Little Rock Comic Con on Facebook or visit lrcomiccon.com. Comic book lovers, visit the wildstars.com today. today. From the mind of author and comic book industry expert Michael Tierney, it's not just a comic book, it's a comic book novel. The Wild Stars is sci-fi and so much more. Learn the explanations behind UFOs and space gods. This isn't the Twilight Zone. This is the region of the Milky Way galaxy known as The Wild Stars. We guarantee you've never read anything like it. The complete comic book novel took 20 years to tell, with one reviewer noting, the story of the Wild Stars stretches ambitiously across space and time, from small town murders to the destruction of planets, with every event given multiple layers of meaning. If you haven't read The Wild Stars, you're missing out. Visit thewildstars.com today. today. The Die is Cast. Plunge into worlds of fantastic adventure where dragons lie and the undead stalk the shades of your mind's imagines. Where creatures of legend plunder wealth through the horror of their passage. Monsters grim and foul hold the ecstasy of gold and the renown of glory. All this and more awaits you and your friends in the unlimited, fantastic world of the Castles and Crusades role-playing game from Troll Lord Games. Visit your friendly local game store or trolllord.com to get your copy today. A rules-light, adaptable game that has stood the test of time. Twelve years in constant publication with no new additions, Castles and Crusades is the original easy-to-play attribute check system. Join us and unleash your imagination. Visit your friendly local game store or trolllord.com to get your copy of castles and crusades today shame plays radio is blessed to have sponsors and we appreciate them very much however did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as one dollar an episode simply go to patreon.com slash shame plays That, that's what I get for doing this from home. I goobered up my microphone. Hey, welcome back to Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. Uh, as I just said, uh, I'm a little bit under the weather, so I'm doing this from my home office for the first time ever. And uh, I goobered up the mute on my microphone. But anyway, pressing on, as you tend to do in live radio, the show must go on. We're joined by Tom Scioli, who is, I can't stress this enough, a unique and important talent in the comic book industry. So if you don't know Tom's work, go check it out. I guarantee you, you've never seen anything like it. Uh, but we're talking to Tom about, uh, he's got a, a, a comic that he's working on called Kirby, which is actually a biography of Jack Kirby's life. And they're also going to talk a little bit about why Jack Kirby himself is so important to comics. So uh, let's, just, let's just take it straight from there, uh, Tom. As You know, you're a writer artist. Uh, you know, your art is, I, I, again, you know, it, 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 with this, with radio and podcast being a, not a visual medium, it's hard to get across your, your art is, uh, groundbreaking in the way, you know, the way that you really push a comic book panel and what it can do to its limits. But why is Jack Kirby? Why is he so important to comics and to like you as a comic book artist? Well, I mean, you could come at it from, from a million directions, but just like real quickly, I mean, uh, the importance is undeniable when you just look at the movies, all those things that we've just been talking about in the previous segment, uh, like every Marvel movie that comes out, every TV show, uh, you know, most, if not all of the characters are either creations or co-creations of Kirby. And then on the other side with the DC stuff, it's not as many, but still, uh, you know, Steppenwolf, the villain in the Justice League movie, that's a Kirby creation. A lot of the, you know, planets and technology were, Kirby creations from his New Gods comic, and then now there's a New Gods movie on the way. So, uh, uh, so you know, there's, it, you know, it, it's it's beyond comics at this point. Now it's just 
Kirby and pop culture. Like uh, superhero movies are the biggest thing right now, and and Kirby's the en- engineer behind most of them. So uh, there's that. But then when when you take it a step back and go into comics, he created that like language of the the action com of the superhero comic. Um, if you look at the comics that were around concurrently with him, and then after he makes his big impact, you you see the you see the whole field change you know there's there's like the 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 pre kirby and and post kirby in in superheroes and um and he was there at every stage he was there uh in the in the 30s you know at the at the very very beginning of the medium he was he was there in the 40s inventing new stuff uh captain america and then the 50s where um uh you know him and joe simon invented um romance comics and and uh then the 60s that that uh revolution in comics that it, with him and Stan Lee and Steve Ditko where they created, you know, you know, these, these, these characters we all, we all know and love like the Fantastic Four and, uh, X-Men, Spider-Man and, uh, Avengers, you know, that, that whole, that whole world. And then in the seventies, he reinvented the wheel all over again with new gods, forever people, Mr. Miracle, the Eternals. He created these kind of like, uh, almost like new age superheroes where there's sort of these like mythological gods that have come from other worlds, but have, you know, been here all along and, 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 you know, helped form our mythologies. And it's, it's just kind of remarkable when you take a step back and look at his whole body of work. I mean, it was, it was a lifetime. He worked, he worked on comics uh, from his teenage years until, you know, pretty much the day he died. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a life lived on paper. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's really hard to, to distill, you know, into just a few minutes, but, you know, the, the two main things that, that I usually, uh, you know, kind of put Kirby into one, uh, as you said, the, the, it's almost ridiculous. The amount of characters he created, (laughs) I mean, it's, it's almost, it's like, what, how can one person be involved with creating that many characters that were so important, not just to comics, but to culture now? Uh, you know, with, with the movies and TV shows. And I mean, they're, it's proliferating like crazy, but two, and I wanted to, I wanted to take a step back. I hear a lot, a lot of comics artists mention this, that he not only contributed to the language of superhero comics, as far as the artistic storytelling, but in, in some ways he kind of defined it. So can you, can you help as a non-artist? Can you help me understand, like, why was he so important? Like, what do I see in comics today in, in the, you know, from panel to panel storytelling and the fight scenes and all that? What do I see in there that is uniquely Kirby that we wouldn't have without Kirby? Well, I mean, the quick one is Kirby Crackle. Uh, every Kirby time, Crackle. It, yeah, when there's, a, there's yeah. like a cosmic effect, if there's an explosion, if there's fire, you see yeah. it, it drawn in a series of black dots and, and empty white space. And, uh, I mean, every superhero artist uses it, whether they know it comes from Kirby or not. That's, that's like a, a pure Kirby invention. And then there's things that, like, maybe he wasn't the first guy to do something, but, but he, he defined it. He, he, was, he was the best person to do it. And so one would be, like, the double-page splash. Uh, yes. You know, when he was working with Joe Simon, they kind of, like, really, like, perfected and, and, and maybe possibly invented that, you know, just that wide-angle shot of like insane action, you know, go, you know, going from one page to the next. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, you know, it's like, it's just like endless stuff. You can name the, the Kirby squiggle. Like there's, there's a way of rendering energy and rent and making something look metallic with these like series of squiggly lines that, that is, you know, you know, just totally associated with, with Kirby. It really, uh, you know, came to its full, uh, fruition in the Silver Surfer. Like if you look at the Silver Surfer, all those squiggly lines that make him, uh, you know, look shiny, look, look and, metallic. And yeah, that's Kirby. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and I've also heard it. I've, I've seen the case made that it's also how he laid out like his fight scenes. Yeah, like the way the the posture of the characters as they're punching each other. Like they're just he contributed so much. You know, uh, yeah, he started. To, in, in animation. He was an animation artist before he was a comics artist. And so you see that he like really, you look at his comics and you could just not read the words and you see them move. You see the, the, the going from, you know, close up to, 
to pull back and vice versa, and you see the, the, the punch come in and, and, and the, you know, the room explode. It, it, his comics move in a way that no one else and one, no one else has did before that. And um, he made his comics, they looked three-dimensional uh, before, you know, the 3D, you know, glasses technology was invented. They, they, they were broken up into these different layers. And so when you know, 3D came around and they started doing 3D comics, it was an easy translation of his, of his work. His work was made for that. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so, um, like, if you could, like, let's say you got aspiring comics artists out there right now, and it's listening to this. If you could distill just one simple, pure thing from Jack Kirby style for them to learn, what what would you recommend? For Jack Kirby, it was just to keep drawing. I think that was his main thing. He just never stopped. There was nothing. There was nothing that could keep him from making a comic. Uh, no excuses. He would just sit down and get to work. And I think that that work ethic is probably the most powerful thing. And and that's something that anybody can achieve. It's not something that that you know you have to be born with or you have to go to a certain school for. Like anybody can do. It's just you know put in the time, put in the effort. You know, but you keep your butt on that seat. And, and, right. and, and get to work like Jack Kirby did. Yeah, he was uh, what, what, prolific, would, would be putting it mildly. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, no doubt. So, uh, it, and it, are you reading any of the, like, for example, um, uh, Tom King's Mr. Miracle, or are you, you know, the, the stuff they're putting out today using like the fourth world, or have you been keeping up with any of that? Yeah. Yeah. The Tom King, Mr. Miracle, I'm, I'm enjoying a lot. It's really great. And, uh, Mitch Gerard's, uh, art is phenomenal on it. It's, yeah, it's, it's really nice. And it's been a while since they did anything, uh, at these, right. those sort of new gods and, and Mr. Miracle and forever. That, so I'm that, so glad that, they're back and, and in good hands. That fourth world stuff is so amazing. Yeah. I mean, like you were talking about, you know, it's like a mythology. It really is. Like he, he invented a. It's really a religious mythology for for the DC universe. I mean, because a lot of it is based directly on. Uh, I, I I don't know. If, I don't know if I'd say Christian. I would say biblical mythology. Yeah, Judeo Christian. Uh, Judeo-Christian. Yeah, Judeo Christian. In fact, I didn't know till I was reading the background from Tom King. Uh, I think it was Tom King said this from the new Mr. Miracles. I never knew that Mr. Miracle was Jack Kirby's Jesus in that mythology. I never knew that. Uh, I knew yeah. that high father was obviously, you know, in dark yeah. side. And, father's and, uh, son of, he's the son of the God of the Jack Kirby universe. So, right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of direct and indirect, correlation between the judeo-christian but but the fourth world is just amazing you know uh, so much stuff that you can do with the fourth world uh you know apocalypse new genesis all those characters but yeah i agree i, I you know tom king is like he's one of those writers that can come along and i know you mentioned the artist too and i'm not taking away from the artist uh but he's really you know tom king's really put an interesting spin on on the on on the fourth world and and uh how they how the the new gods relate to each other and all this. So I wanted to ask you one other thing before we get to a break. And then after the break, I want to talk, I want you to tell us about your Kirby biographical comic that you're doing. Make sure people know about that. Um, I've noticed like reading transformers versus GI Joe, your transformers versus GI Joe, not mm -hmm. the one from the eighties. Um, you, you would do this sort of faded page background like aging newsprint. But then when you used white as a color, I mean, it just popped, right? That yeah. white became even. And I noticed that Ed Pisker, is that how you say his name? Ed Pisker yeah. mm -hmm. uh, does the same thing, you know, his X-Men Grand Design. In fact, I'll be mm -hmm. honest, when I picked up X-Men Grand Design, I was like, somebody's trying to do Tom Scioli kind of stuff. So I don't know yeah. how long you and Ed have both been doing that art style. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I'm not me saying, and, and yeah. Ed, uh, we used to. Uh, work in the same place. We used to share a studio together for a while. I mean, we, and, and, you know, we get together, you know, at, like once a week at least. And so we trade, uh, trade uh, tips and secrets and stuff. Okay. So, so that, I mean, that explains like why, a, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the way I'd put it, y'all don't have the same style, but you guys do seem to live just a few blocks from each other in the same artistic borough, if that makes right. sense. And, and, so, and yeah. Physically we live a few blocks away too. So, oh, how funny. Okay. 
it's uh, on, you know, like that's going to happen when, when artists get together, right. things are going to rub up. I've, I've learned a ton of stuff from him and uh, I'd like to think that you know, he'd, he'd say the same thing, uh, uh, but I can't speak for him. But yeah. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, there's definitely a, a cross, uh, cross influence there. Well, he does kind of the same thing with the, um, um, the, well, like he'll use kind of a faded background, but then when he use white, it just pops off the page. Mm -hmm. uh, so and, is that yeah. something that Kirby did? No, I mean, I, is the, that... first time, the first time I saw that was in a DC comic called Bizarro Comics. And I think it was Dean Haspiel and Evan Dorkin did a comic together. It was like a Shazam comic. And when the ghost of Shazam shows up, he's pure white with this whole like yellowish, everything else is yellowish. And then a fake Shazam ghost shows up and he's not he's he's got newsprint too and so the way you could tell and and so that was the first time i ever saw somebody do oh, okay that. but man there's all kinds of possibilities there so it's a really a, it's a yeah. really effective technique i mean it really pops off the page uh, mm -hmm. you know but i would you know I, I i love your work i would recommend probably people also go check out x-men grand design that ed pisker did yeah, that great. style of artwork you guys do, I don't, I don't know what the name of it is, but I love it. You know, there, there's a lot of personality and a lot of creativity going on there. Um, but, you know, I, I'm biased. I would recommend your work over, over X-Men Grand Design. But when you're done looking at Tom Scioli's stuff, go check out X-Men Grand Design. Yeah, there's a close second, there's people. There's room on your rack all right. for all of them. Yeah, that'll work. All right. I got to get us to another break. After that, I want to talk about your uh, Kirby comic strip, uh, that, or not strip, your webcomic that you're doing. I want to make sure people know about. Some goblins are your friends. Game Goblins is Central Arkansas's premier retailer, Magic the Gathering, Warhammer 40K, board games, card games, RPGs, miniatures, and hobby accessories. Conveniently located at 1121 South Bowman, right on the corner of Bowman and Canis in West Little Rock, I heartily recommend Game Goblins for all your gaming needs. Make sure to check out their customer loyalty program that rewards you based on your actual purchases. Game Goblins earns your business and keeps it. First-time customers mention Shane Plays and receive $10 off your purchase of $50 or more. Tell them Shane Plays sent you. Hey, welcome back to Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Stacks. We're talking with Tom Scioli, who is a unique, uh, are a unique talent in the comics industry. We've been talking about Jack Kirby and why he's so important, which is really impossible to do in, you know, uh, the, the 20 or 30 minutes that we had to talk about it. But just, you know, Jack Kirby, we would not have modern American four color superhero comics uh, or even comics in general without Jack Kirby. Just I mean, it, it, it's true. We wouldn't have them as we know them today. We'd still have them, but they would probably be quite different between the characters he created and the techniques and language of comics that uh that that he contributed to the art form so tom scioli who is my guest remember folks go check out uh he's got transformers versus gi joe from idw which is mind-blowing go check it out he's got american barbarian he did the superpowers uh back up in the first six issues of um uh, cave carson has a cybernetic eye uh he's got other projects he works on right now he's got a a Kirby biographical comic that he's doing, which can be found at uh, his website. What, what's your web? What's the best website for people to check you out? I know there's Am. Was it Am Barb and Am Barb? What's the other one? B A R B dot com or Tom dot com. But the um, the Kirby comic specifically runs on Instagram at Kirby Comic. So it's like in, Instagram dot com slash Kirby Comic, or if you're on Instagram, just do look for at Kirby Comic, all one word. Right. And this literally, I mean, I've, I've read it, I'm keeping up with it and it's, you're doing a biographical story of Kirby's right now. He's still in his childhood, uh, for the yeah. most part. Uh, well, you know, I get the sense, Tom, that, that you, you probably have a lot of projects you could work on if you wanted to, but I feel like that you're the kind of person that like you only work on the stuff that seems interesting to you at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. that that's the sense I get. I could be wrong. You could, you know, dispel that notion. Uh, why, you know, why, why at this time in your career, have you said, this is what I'm going to work on and this is the format I'm going to put it out in? Well, I mean, I've sort of worked in, I, I did comics like the kind of comics Kirby did escapist science fiction, right. action adventure comics. And I, I wanted to do something, you know, something real, something that actually happened, something that I didn't just make up. 
and Kirby, like making a comic about Jack Kirby, is is probably other than you know writing an autobiography of me or whatever. It's probably the the thing that I'm most qualified <laughs> to write about. I um, you know study. I spent my entire adult life trying to reverse engineer you know what Kirby did. I and and so I mean I studied his art. I studied his work. I, and and but then I also studied his life. I studied his work habits. Everything. So just in in the the years that it's it, that. Um, you know, it's taken me to become like the artist and writer that I am. Uh, I've been spending all that time just like learning about Jack Kirby. So, so basically, uh, with you know, I, I can say I'm, an, I'm a Jack Kirby expert at this point, and and uh, and it's just like the most natural thing in the world to to tell his story. Okay, I don't know. I, I think my Skype's breaking up on me a little bit. I don't. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yeah, you sound. Uh, like- I might have to dis- disconnect and recall back in. But did you now? What do you do? You plan to eventually? Well, first, how long do you plan to go with Kirby in the format you're doing it? Like, how long will, do you think it will tell you to? to go I mean, ahead. I've, I've I've been doing it for maybe like seven or eight months at this point, and I'm I'm up to like you know he just got drafted. And and just this week, I've been working on like you know him at boot camp and and uh, you know manning an anti aircraft gun and stuff like that. So so I'm that far into it. So I'm thinking you know it it, it could be a while because I want to tell his whole life story. Uh, I'm moving through it somewhat quickly, but still there's a long way to go. There's a long way. Uh, you know we're we're only in in, right. the, in the early 1940s at this point. Uh, and then to you know take this this uh, this sort of web comic. And then uh, you know have have like you know the book version like an actual physical version of it come out. Well, that that was my uh, one of the things I was curious about. You know, do you so you do plan on eventually releasing this as a like a a hard copy that I can you know like a trade yeah. paperback or, or something that I mm-hmm. can get. Yeah, and, and um, like there's there's a publisher lined up. It's 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 all good to go. Um, like we haven't announced it yet. It's still a ways off because uh, I'm still you know I'm still making it. So, uh, but but you know, we'll, you know, stay tuned, uh, and and uh, we'll have the announcement of, of you know who's going to be publishing it, where it's going to come. So, how long does it take you to, um, like on Instagram, you know, you'll release like a a panel at a time, uh, but how long does it? And I love the I love the one I'm looking at it right now where he's sick. And the Jewish rabbis are doing basically an, an exorcism on him. Demon, come out of this boy! Mm-hmm. How, like, how long does it take you to um, to do one of these panels and get it out? You know, even though on your yeah. website, you know, you release it like a full page, but on on Instagram, you know, it's just uh, you know, you do a panel at a time. So, uh, you know, how long does it take you to do one of these panels? Yeah, I mean, the panel. Uh, there's basically, I basically do like twelve panels a week. So like like the equivalent like two pages worth of comics every week, um, so yeah. So however you know however long that you know uh, right. And, and so sometimes I try to squeeze in more because I'm doing other stuff at the same time. But sometimes I try to squeeze in like one more page, but it, it always seems like it, it ends up being two pages a week, no matter no matter what I try. Okay. Well, I hear the music. Uh, Zach, how much time do we have left? I don't, I'm not in my normal studio to, to see my... 45 seconds. We got 45 seconds, Tom. Man, it always goes so quick. Thanks again for coming yeah. on. I got to do this to you. It's the bad joke of the week, man. Uh, and folks, go to TomCioli.com or go to AmBarb.com or look for the Kirby comic on Instagram and keep up with what he's doing. But where do most superheroes live, Tom? This, that's the bad joke of the week. Where do most superheroes where do most, live? Uh, the supernatural world. I don't know. No, Cape Town. Cape Town. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Tom, it. thanks again. Radio always goes so quick. I wish we had longer to talk. But thanks so much again for coming on. And I wish you luck in, all, in everything you're doing. And keep doing it like Kirby. Just keep drawing. Okay, thanks, Shane. All right, thanks, Tom. By his own admission, Jack Kirby's superhero creations are so numerous even he can't keep track. After some 40 years at the drawing board and an estimated 40,000 pages of action with such characters as Captain America, Fantastic Four, and the Avengers, Kirby is the undisputed king of comic book superheroes. What do your characters represent? Well, the characters represent uh, a sort of a a transcendent feeling that we we all have inside us that... uh, uh, we could do better. We want to do better. Uh, we haven't time to do better. 
that uh, we can be the people that we lionize. To anyone passing by his Southern California home, Jack looks like anything but a muscle-bound superhero. But according to him, it's what's inside the mind that counts. If you look at my characters, you'll find me. No matter what kind of character you create or assume, a little of yourself must remain there. As he sits each day at his board, alone with his characters, Jack Kirby is far from lonely. I haven't got the trappings of a circus, but uh, there in my mind is a very active and bright and colorful place that's as good as any circus that I've ever seen. And uh, I live with that. And I enjoy it immensely. Shane Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors, and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as $1 an episode? Simply go to patreon.com slash Shane Plays.